All right, we're live. Welcome to the Scoped Years of Acquisition in, in Cloud Gaming. Um, really good to see you. I'm joined here, here with our co-host Anto Bach from, from Play Ventures and, and Paulina Martikana from Maki VC. What if you, we start with introductions? So who are you, Paulina? Hi, uh, and, and welcome on Maki VC's uh, behalf as well. I'm Paulina Martikainen, Investment Director at Maki. And, and just a few words of our fund. Uh, so we are an early stage VC firm investing in deep tech and brand driven companies across consumer and enterprise spaces. And our um, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial core team is uh, based out of Helsinki, whereas our global network or our LP network is uh, spread across Nordics, Europe and Asia. And hence we have a mandate to invest uh, globally. And Timo Soininen from Small Giant Games, um, uh, who will take the stage later today is an example um, of, of these people um, who we are humbled to have uh, uh, backing our fund and um, and he's also been actively uh, engaging with some of our portfolio companies. Uh, in practice, our portfolio uh, consists of uh, very deep tech cases such as quantum computing company, uh, but then we also have uh, uh, consumer companies, so for instance, a gaming gaming studio in our portfolio. So uh, what really is paramount to us, instead of a specific uh, technology <coughs> or a specific industry, really is um, partnering with founders who are relentless in challenging uh, existing category norms. Um, and Mainframe, who will, who will also take the stage, uh, um, uh, their venture is, is set to... Um, create the first cloud native uh, sandbox MMO. And, and I think that's an example of a company who mirrors this uh, thesis very well. And a funny, funny anecdote with regards to uh, mainframe is that um, when we invested in mainframe uh, last summer uh, in their seed round, uh, that was actually already a second time around that our founding partner Ilka uh, invested in Thor and their, their venture. So I guess that also also uh, tells something something about how we actually are, are investing in teams. So uh, that's uh, us briefly, uh, um, and I'm happy to tell you more one-on-one -on -one at, at some, uh, some point later. Cool. Uh, what about you, Ori Anton? Hi everyone, I'm Anton from Play Ventures. So Play Ventures is an early stage VC firm investing in games and game services startups. Um, we have a special knack for free to play uh, in terms of companies building free to play mobile and free to play PC games. In addition to startups building out technology and services for the game industry, game industry as a whole. Uh, we're based out of Helsinki and Singapore, but investing, investing all over the world. Uh, the, the firm is fun, founded by Harry Manninen and Henrik Suuran and both both long-standing uh, game entrepreneurs and investors who are now looking to put their skills and experience to use and help help the next the next gaming founders build build the next big thing uh, with, with, within the space. Uh, we have uh, our, our our focus lies in the pre-seed and seed stages, so make sure to reach out to us if you're building something 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 in the space. Cool. And my name is Mika Huttunen. I'm the CEO of Slush uh, Global Movement with a mission to create and help founders to change the world and and obviously this year has been really interesting for us as well um, due to the fact we have to cancel our main event but we are doing a lot of interesting projects to to help founders forward as well as this year and and this session is is one great example of that mm -hmm. um we have pretty pretty interesting 70 minutes coming up really really cool lineup and we're going to start the first discussion really shortly uh, around um, player acquisition and retention in the era of, of cloud gaming. And after that, we're going to move ahead uh, to discussion around how the best practices uh, around user acquisition can, uh, in mobile gaming can be applied to cloud gaming. And maybe a couple practicalities of this session. Obviously, there is a chat uh, open there. It's really active, it seems, already. And mm -hmm. we're going to have the Q&A uh, all the time open. Um, so feel free to post your questions uh, whenever you wish. Uh, and those questions will be answered in the end uh, by Timo and Thor, um, at least uh, as long as we have time left. But I think it's it's time to move ahead for the for the discussion. And without further ado, uh, uh, I would like to welcome uh, <coughs> Andrew Chen, general partner of A16C, and CEO and co-founder at Mainframe Industries, Thor Gunnarsson, to discuss and to, to be hosted by Anton Bachman. So, what if you? start right away. Sure thing. Thanks, Mika. Okay. Thanks, Mika. All right. Paulina, for the kind introductions, moving moving you guys to BC, BCC just for a moment now that we're having a chat with, with Andrew and, and Thor. 
So I'm um, really, really thrilled to have you, Andrew and Thor here. Uh, would you mind giving just a quick, a brief uh, introduction so on, on your part as well before we dive into the topic? Thor, you wanna go first? Sure, I'll, I'll start. Uh, I'm Thor Gunderson, uh, native of Iceland, but a uh, member of the games industry now for a couple of decades, uh, working in, in various parts of the world across both mobile gaming uh, multi-user virtual worlds, MMOs, console games, and more, uh, and uh, co-founded Mainframe uh, just over a year ago. Great, um, and I'm Andrew Chen. I'm a general partner at Andrews and Horowitz. Thor and I have uh, just started working together um, uh, recently, uh, where we've become um, a new, very happy investor in, in Mainframe. Um, and, uh, and at Andrews and Horowitz, uh, we've, we've been investing in um, a number of different companies, a lot, many different sectors, pretty much the whole thing um, over the last uh, 10 years. Um, and, you know, one of the big areas we've gotten very excited about is, is, is games. Um, and then, you know, in particular recently, obviously mainframe, we also did a big investment in uh, Roblox. We've invested in a number of X uh, ride games uh, alumni. Um, we have a whole bunch of other ones that are, that are unannounced. Um, you know, there's probably a dozen games investments uh, overall. Um, we were also early in uh, Oculus um, and Zynga and, uh, you know, quite, quite a few others. Awesome. Thanks. Always good to hear that there's more capital flowing into the games industry. Um, I thought about giving uh, just the, to, our, to our viewers or listeners uh, just a quick brief on, on what cloud gaming is, and then, then we'll make sure to, to dive into the, the topics regarding user acquisition and retention within the space. Uh, so for all of you who, who might not be too familiar with, with, with cloud gaming, uh, games today run locally on a wide array of uh, hardware ranging from low-end mobile devices to high-end consoles and, and gaming PCs. And the attributes of these devices set the limits for what kinds of games can be played on them. So this naturally limits AAA games, so big budget games, uh, to the latter end of the spectrum. And uh, one of cloud gaming's promises is to bring uh, the majority of gameplay processing to data centers uh, outside of players' homes, making expensive gaming hardware less important. However, Arguably the more interesting promise of cloud gaming is how it allows game developers to design entirely new types of gameplay. And uh, this doesn't just limit to what kinds of games we'll see in the future, but, but also extends itself to how players are acquired and retained. Uh, and as games will be accessed and played through video streams in the future, they will lend themselves to, uh, out to new ways of engagement throughout the whole video ecosystem. Uh, and before, be, really, be, before, before diving into this more, more deeply, Thor, could you give us uh, just a quick brief on, on sort of what kind of uh, game you're, you're currently building at Mainframe? Yeah, ha happy to. Uh, so uh, Mainframe is a, a developer founded in Helsinki with a parallel studio set up here in Reykjavik, where I'm uh, joining you from tonight today. Uh, we, we started Mainframe with the uh, sort of basic assumption that with the advent of cloud gaming, uh, social online games, of which MMOs, of course, are sort of the pinnacle experience, would be uh, a perfect match for this promise that cloud gaming brings uh, to players, which is to be able to access a window or a, a sort of a, a view into the virtual world of game uh, that they're playing from any screen. So this ability to uh, kind of play from mobile, from your TV or console, or uh, indeed from your laptop is incredibly powerful. And we think that it fundamentally changes both how people will uh, access and kind of begin to experience games over the cloud, but of course, fundamentally how we create them as developers. So with Mainframe, what we really did last winter was really assemble kind of a, a fairly unusual cross-section of developers that come from variously a background in MMO development, live operations, uh, with a number of the kind of early team around CCP games who created EVE Online, uh, but also a, a cohort of people from uh, studios like Remedy, uh, kind of one of the best sort of AAA PC console studios out of Helsinki, and uh, a, a number of people with a mobile background, so from companies like Next Games and Rovio. And then we think this was critical because we think that the kind of creative and business opportunity that cloud gaming brings is going to require people that have expertise in all of those corners of the industry. And so we're hard at work on our first project. It is an open world sandbox MMO, uh, and uh, we'll hopefully have more to say about the game itself uh, before too long. Awesome. I think that really resonates also with how we've been saying that that this has basically been the game you you and your team have been preparing your your whole your whole careers for, into building. And as a, as a personal uh, big MMO aficionado, aficionado as you know, Thor, I'm I'm really excited to to actually get it, get to play playing the game at some point, hopefully in the near future. But um, okay. So diving diving into the questions now, I'm, I'd like to start with you, Andrew. 
So you've been bullish on the opportunity regarding products that automatically generate video when users engage with them. Uh, you've mentioned games as some of the top products in, the, in this category to create more viral acquisition and engagement through videos and live streams. Uh, and I would like to know, how do you expect cloud gaming to amplify this opportunity? Yeah, let, let me actually unpack a little bit what I what I mean by, you know, um, why I'm excited about uh, products that automatically generate video. So, you, you know, one of the big observations you might have about any huge, you know, consumer, uh, you know, um, uh, revolution in, in kind of new new products, new apps, et cetera, is that there's always some underlying uh, platform shift that's driving it, right? When you have uh, smartphones that come up, you know, that's what's going to enable, um, you know, Supercell to emerge. That's going to, you know, let Uber emerge. That's going to let, you know, a lot of these other, you know, products. And, you know, before that, you know, we had the Facebook platform. Before that, we had, um, you know, the, the internet, you know, the browser itself, right? And so every time there's, you know, one of these big, um, you know, platform shifts, it, it, can, it can be really big. One of the things that is really fascinating is that the last uh, 18 months especially has been really just, you know, an incredible, um, uh, you know, set of achievements for video and for streaming. Um, you know, you look at uh, the emergence of TikTok in a huge way. You look at the emergence of, um, you know, Instagram stories and Snapchat stories in a big way. You know, these are all forms of videos. I, I was just uh, doing some research before this talk. You have individual videos on YouTube, like uh, Despacito, which is a, you know, music video, Baby Shark Dance, which is, another, you know, it's like a funny kids video. The individual videos with 6 billion views on one video, right? It's just incredible. YouTube itself has you know, 2 billion monthly active users. And then if you were to add that and TikTok and Snapchat and Instagram, you know, you're talking about aggregating many, many, many billions of people. So I think what's happening is you have this, you know, huge underlying content shift where there's a lot of new video um, platforms and infrastructure that are happening. And at the same time, um, you have to ask yourself, well, you know, if, if there's a product that that as the users engage the product, it automatically generates and publishes video uh, to the internet, that's going to create a lot of really interesting places to go with user acquisition, with retention, with engagement, because it's going to attract users to then come, you know, think, oh, wow, what is this amazing game that people are playing? Oh, okay, great. This is, you know, this is TFT, this is Valor, and I'm going to click on it, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to play it as well. And so I think, you know, with that context in mind, it is really impressive to then think about what could cloud you know, gaming get us because what it means is that you know, if, if for all of you that have tried streaming on you know, Twitch today, for any of you that have um, you know, been, been, been making um, you know, videos uh, while you're gaming, it's actually a really annoying and high friction experience. You have to install OBS, you have to you know, set up you know, multiple monitors, like there's all these things that you have to do. And I think what, what cloud gaming is really gonna allow that is, is you know, um, is going to happen is that it will just be this automatic magical experience it'll just be like you hit a button you know and you hit a key in the game and then you're you're, you're streaming to you know youtube you're streaming to twitch etc i think that that in itself will be really interesting i think the second thing that it's going to allow is um it's going to allow pe people to actually deep link into the experiences of the game right it will make it so that if there's an amazing incredible boss fight that's happening and people want to jump in and they want to spectate or they want to, um, you know, be in the middle of the action. Um, you know, there's going to be a way that that's going to be on Twitch or that's going to be on YouTube and people are going to click on it and then they're going to go into the game. And be because, you know, there isn't a 40 gig install that stands between you and being in the experience. And then, and then the final thing I'll mention is once you push a lot of the video and in the intelligence in the cloud, what that means is um, we're going to be able to, to actually, um, you know, uh, apply machine learning techniques to figure out the highlights, to figure out the most interesting interactions in the game. We're going to be able to cut, um, you know, these videos to be extremely engaging in ways. Again, it's all, it, it's going to be all automatic. It's going to be, you know, um, there's going to be this huge corpus of data. People are going to be able to, um, you know, play around with all, all these highlights and it's going to make it even more watchable. So I, I really think that this incredible emergence of the video flat platforms combined with where we see games going is going to mean that games is going to be, you know, really one of the, it's already one of the most dominant, um, you know, forms of content, uh, you know, for video. But I think we're all going to start seeing it in every video platform that, that we use, whether that's TikTok or Instagram or, any, you know, any of these. And so I, I, I think it's a really, really interesting opportunity.
And I definitely also think that the, the concept of deep links is, is going to be very interesting also to see what, what, what kind of stuff uh, game designers will, will come up with in, in the coming years and, and, and then seeing this as a, a sort of a very frictionless way of, of having... That's right. Well, That's right. I mean, you know, the, the internet is like the web. Can you imagine the web without links? Right, like that's that's where we are in games, right? And so it just seems inevitable that once we get there, it's going to fundamentally change the the, the kind of interactions that you know we'll all we'll, we'll all have um, you know with with these products. Mm. And spectator participation is also something we're going to cover cover a bit later in in this discussion, also. Um, but sort of moving, also giving some context onto on, on sort of MMOs and and why why MMOs are specifically uh, or. Could get could get a, a lot a lot a lot of use from 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 being cloud based. So Thor, I'd like to dig into in, in, a bit into your experience. And so MMOs have traditionally suffered from from a cold start problem, as they often require uh, a good amount of players to create the ideal experience. Uh, could you tell a bit about your own experiences with the, this problem, especially when building out Eve Online back in the day, uh, or and other previous MMO projects, and and how you plan to tackle it with 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 mainframe and, and what kind of benefits cloud gaming could bring into this problem? Yeah, so back in the the old days of sort of the uh, early MMO space, uh, you know, CCP uh, originally uh, planned and, and launched Eve Online in a box product. Uh, you know, it was shipped on a disc and, and people would uh, buy that for you know, 60 bucks. Um, that, you know, continued for quite a while. CCP was one of the first companies that kind of moved fully into digital distribution. But we saw for a number of years, uh, the kind of MMO space all kind of based on this old school method of you know, shipping the game or the client in a box. Uh, and then, you know, hoping that basically you would be able to kind of get enough launch momentum uh, as the new game came out, that you would get that kind of critical mass of players before the 30 day you know, bundled subscription for that box basically uh, expired. These days, of course, that's fundamentally changed. And, you know, when we think about kind of what we did over the years at CCP, as we were looking at ways of acquiring players, you know, one of the fundamental observations that came to us very early, and indeed it was kind of the, the founding theory of the game, is that, you know, the, the most powerful uh, facet of any MMO is the social layer of that game. Uh, so if a game is designed around maximizing human interaction, uh, the way in which you acquire players is all based around that social layer. So, you know, back in the day, we had, you know, very successful programs like uh, the Buddy program in Eve Online, where you were able to basically uh, bring a player into the game. Uh, they would join, and if they kind of converted to become a subscriber, you know, you got some free game time uh, as well. So that kind of social referral uh, mechanism was, you know, pretty powerful uh, back in the day. These days, of course, when you think about you know how to launch an online game, nobody is thinking about box uh, boxes anymore. I mean, there are still some legacy projects that still use that, but if we look at kind of what is kind of you know, a pointer toward the future, we only have to look at how successfully Riot uh, kind of ran the closed beta program for Valorant. Uh, you know, the the kind of uh, way in which they uh, basically seeded influencers and streamers on Twitch with keys to the closed beta, and that basically kind of led to this sort of uh, mass of people coming in to watch the Twitch streams before the closed beta basically lifted. Uh, and you started to see just this crazy bump in Twitch viewer figures uh, for Valorant uh, before it kind of left the closed beta. So that kind of way of acquiring players is, is quite powerful. Of course, uh, working with influencers, working with streamers is kind of a nat natural way to kind of build up that initial interest in the game. But to retain interest and continue to acquire, uh, the way in which you structure a game that actually allows social uh, onboarding and social referral is kind of the critical shift. And of course, with the advent of cloud gaming, that kind of removal of friction, that 40 gig download as Andrew was talking about, that's a critical thing. And that just, it basically opens up uh, a complete new canvas for us as game developers uh, in terms of how we actually allow our players to refer the game to each other. Mm -hmm. And you know, this, was simply, you know, this was simply really hard to do back in the day. And these days it's, it's much easier uh, and it kind of brings that whole social aspect of an MMO to the forefront. Got it. And uh, piggybacking uh, on, on on Andrew's Andrew's previous comment on on the links and 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 then the the spectator gaming I I, I uh, mentioned just a few moments ago. So there's been this discussion on on sort of spectator participation and, and introducing various various layers of gameplay for for people to to engage with as as a low threshold way of participating in the game. For example, looking at a Twitch stream. So, could you give us a sort of 
quick, quick, quick sort of note, quick notes on what kind of game design and what, and, and what role this will play in, in acquisition and retention. And what do you have in store when it comes to mainframe sandbox game? Yeah, I mean, this, this, this sort of facet of cloud gaming is kind of uh, what we spend most of our time thinking about. So if we, if we sort of start with the premise that uh, in a uh, cloud native MMO, every gamer can be a streamer, uh, that they can choose to share basically their play session with other people that are watching, um, you know, they might share that with the kind of classic audience that we find on Twitch or on YouTube, uh, where you're watching a live stream, that's sort of a, you know, passive audience, there's nothing particularly new about that. But the prospect of actually, you know, again, kind of harkening back to what Riot did with Valorant, if you're a player in the game, you have a, a set of keys to the game that you basically have. Uh, you can basically issue those to people on your stream, have them join in the game with you, uh, you know, at your choice. So we'll, we'll see how players use these tools to try and build kind of the social uh, kind of aspect of, you know, their gameplay experience. So for us, we, we kind of think about it as sort of concentric circles of engagement. So on the outer rim are your passive viewers, you know, your audience on Twitch or YouTube or on Mixer. Uh, but the pro prospect of basically moving people further into that circle of engagement by, for example, giving them a short kind of you know, experience of the game, whether that's at the behest of another player or through an ad that you, you know, display to them, that allows people to take a very short kind of touch point on the game experience. And we think it's going to be most impactful when people do that with other people. You know, that, that's, we think, the, the critical kind of difference uh, in terms of what we can do with a uh, cloud native project. And then, of course, as you bring people uh, from that passive experience to that kind of light participation experience, what you hope to be able to do, of course, is provide them with a, a game loop and a mechanic and a social environment that allows, that brings people into becoming a core member uh, of your community. And, and so as game developers, we have to think fundamentally different, differently about how we market a game, how we, of course, acquire users in this new model. Uh, and the funnel uh, fundamentally changes. It, it becomes a social funnel. And you know, I was thinking, kind of trying to think back where we saw similar kind of behavior in the past. And I, I have to point to you know, the good old days of uh, Farm, Farm Mill, uh, when Facebook basically had an open social graph and you were able to do this kind of acquisition uh, strategy, you know, they had its downsides, of course, but, uh, you know, we haven't seen that sort of very kind of fast viral uh, mechanic for a long time. And I think it's it's due for a comeback because uh, of the, of the uh, capabilities that we get from the cloud. I was just going to add one one other thing, Thor, to your, your point on, you know, the, the concentric circles around um, the gamers versus the spectators, etc. Yeah. You know, I, I find it fascinating. I know it's not a perfect, uh, you know, metaphor, but if you think about something like baseball, right, it's like, you start, you play baseball as a, as a kid or whatever. And then by the time if you're like an adult, you know, chances are you, you probably are playing, like you're yeah. just watching, right? Yeah. And I remember um, uh, talking to some of the, the, the Riot folks about, you know, at what point is it gonna be that there are more people that watch League of Legends than play League of Legends, right? But, it, but you're already seeing that at this point, yeah. right? There's, there's, there's uh, you know, that ratio is really starting to flip. And so I, I think one of the really fascinating parts is that, um, you know, so much of, games today is really oriented around, um, you know, the, 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 the players, but not necessarily the spectators. But I think in a cloud gaming environment, maybe yeah. we'll have way more data about who's just watching and yeah. it'll be much easier to create these hangout experiences, you know, or, or around the whole thing in a way that I think will be transformational for game design. Yeah, couldn't agree more. And I, you know, I think we're just kind of at the, on the tip of the iceberg of what the potentiality is. Uh, you, know, you talked about AI and the ability to kind of uh, do kind of instant replay segments uh, based on the data that you gather. That's one kind of incredibly powerful path. The other one, of course, is you will see celebrities arise in these games, of course, as we've seen in others. And, and so uh, you know, the, the things that we've seen happening in the kind of influencer and the kind of streamer community, of course, will, I think will become supercharged as we have this ability for players to make that migration so easily between spectating and participating. Thinking about the onboarding experience that you that you both mentioned here, um, I'd like to ask you, Andrew, what do you, do you think that the game industry, especially cloud gaming, could could learn something from previous web web two point companies or or SaaS businesses in this regard when designing frictionless signups, uh, registrations, and conversion, etc. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really good question because you know at least as an investor, when I meet teams that are primarily from the mobile side of the world, in terms of mobile gaming versus folks that are from the you know PC console gaming, the DNA and the attitude towards 
um, you know, user acquisition and paid marketing and all that are very, very different, right? The, the mobile uh, gaming folks are, are, you know, from a world where, you, of course, you buy ads, of course, you, you, know, you buy installs, of course, you need to A-B test and optimize the first five minutes of your product experience. Of course, you need to take on, you know, whatever the newest APIs that Apple releases and Google releases, of course, you need to implement those because you need to, you know, go fast. And, and, and those teams tend to be very iterative and, and, and think about metrics and that kind of thing. And I think that's something that um, is very commendable. On the other hand, uh, in many ways, the, the PC console folks um, have a really, really strong uh, background in actually going to market using, um, you know, using influencers by building Discord communities, by, um, you know, working with a lot of different folks on Twitch and the Twitch ecosystem in a way where um, they're not spending a ton of money right off the bat in terms of user acquisition. And so one of the things that I think is very interesting is like taking these two you know, communities and kind of like starting to meld them together because I think inevitably that's what cloud gaming is gonna, you know, is, is going to force, right? You're gonna basically be able to build um, extremely uh, high-end AAA, you know, type experiences, but that, you know, are powered off of an ad that you see on uh, YouTube where you click on the ad and then you're in the game, right? And so you end up needing, I think, the best of both worlds where um, I would guess that the teams that win are not going to be the teams that try to build the most lightweight experience, the most hyper-casual games, and then just buy a lot of ads. I don't think that's going to work. And then on, on the other hand, the teams that build really heavyweight experiences, and it takes four years to build the game, and it costs $100 million, and then by the way, like they're not thinking about paid marketing, that's probably not going to work either. So I think you know together, there's going to be quite a lot of intersection be between the two. These hybrid teams, I think, are very, very interesting. That was one of the things for Mainframe that... Um, that the Andrew Horowitz folks got very excited about was that it was you have the CCP folks and then you have um, you know the, the, you know folks from from mobile gaming in the back. I think the other you know two other kind of follow on effects of allowing for paid marketing for basically AAA type you know experiences in, in, in cloud gaming you know that I want to touch on. I think you know the other really big thing is I think we're going to see way much larger hits. You know if you look at a product like. Counter-Strike, for example, that's been around for, you know, 15 plus years. Part of it is it's just grown organically and it's hard to like onboard people into this like super core experience where the people that are still playing CSGO at this point are like actually really good, right? And like as a noob, you probably don't want to do it. But if you have these teams that actually think a lot about the new user experience, they actually buy ads and there's like this really deep, you know, engagement and retention. I think what's going to happen is once something starts working, these teams are going to dump a lot of capital on it and it's going to, you know, it's, it's, it's going to just explode. And I think um, that becomes important for the, for the second thing I wanted to mention, you know, on this, which is I think it's going to vastly increase the number of startup opportunities that are available um, because a lot of these teams that are spinning out of Riot or Blizzard or Valve or Epic, you know, they may be in, in previous years would have been, you know, dependent on a, a large publisher to work with them to, to bring their game to market if all of a sudden they can actually, you know, build a cloud gaming asset and, um, you know, and, and then just buy ads to do it, you know, similar to the mobile gaming world, we're going to see teams out of Brazil, out of Eastern Europe, out of, you know, China, all sorts of places in the world are going to basically be able to make a run at building a very, very large, uh, you know, revenue game, you know, kind of a billion, billion revenue a year type game, um, you know, with these underlying techniques and kind of the intersection of the two worlds. And so I think, I think that's one of the very interesting things. And, and one of the reasons why I'm really bullish about cloud gaming is I think it'll, it'll really open the field quite a bit, um, even more so than, than what exists today. Mm -hmm. And I'd actually like Thor, for you to follow up that with, if we're not, we're not, not if we're not now thinking that that cloud will basically sort of lower, lower the friction a lot when it comes to accessing mm -hmm. AAA games. Mm -hmm. and, and if we're looking at a, at a a scenario where we will have a multitude of these uh, these new titles uh, on the market, and given the ease of accessing them, do you think players will feel less committed to these games and more prone to switch between titles? And uh, if so, uh, what do you believe could be done from a player retention perspective? Yeah, so so from that perspective, cloud gaming is a double-edged sword. Uh, it, you're absolutely right that you will be able to move you know very quickly between different uh, games and sample those kind of ducking in and out, but. You know, fundamentally, when we think about it, at least from the perspective of uh, a, an MMO, uh, you know, we think about kind of what really drives retention for a successful MMO, and that is the social network. 
forms within the game. The friendships or the conflicts that form within the game, these are really the key retention drivers. So, you know, back in the day when we were running EVE Online, you know, we'd been in the market for a number of years. Uh, we saw large launches happen. Uh, we would see a dip in our numbers for perhaps, you know, 60 days while people were sampling, uh, you know, the latest, you know, $200 million MMO that was competing with us. What happened kind of inevitably was people always came back uh, because their friendships were in our game. Uh, you know, their, their kind of, their most valued kind of interactions that they had uh, were happening within our project. So that, that's still a truism in terms of how you build and retain. You, you really have to kind of bring an experience that very quickly allows those social bonds to form in the game because they ultimately are the switching costs that, uh, that you can basically affect when people are able to move as quickly between games as they do in the future. And that will definitely sort of both uh, I'm sure it will both provide us a, as a, both an opportunity as a challenge to sort of create these different onboarding experiences. If we're looking now at a, at a sort of box AAA game, you're always going through this, or most most of the time you're going through the same tutorial of that game yeah. uh, to sort of get a grasp on, on what's happening. But now, as we as we talked about the deep links, uh, we can be seeing that you know I'm streaming some I'm streaming something. I'm putting a link to a couple of my friends to join in on the fight that I'm in. And uh, that onboarding experience might be very different to, for example, what uh, if, if if Mika, for example, is 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 playing the game and sending a link where where he's in another dungeon or he's he's farming something somewhere and and then seeing that sort of onboarding experience there. So, so definitely a, a both a challenge uh, and an opportunity. Yeah, I, I think social onboarding is is going to be critical to the success of, of games in the future. Uh, of course, we'll still have. The more conventional type of onboarding slash tutorial experience for people that are, for example, accessing the game, uh, you know, through uh, you know a paid marketing campaign and, and so on. But if your friend you know recommends the game to you on Facebook and you jump in, the person who onboards you is that friend. Uh, it is not a tutorial that you have to go through for two hours and kind of grind your way up to level eighty before you get to have meaningful gameplay with your mm -hmm. buddy because he's level eighty, you're level one. But, you know, these are game design issues that partly you know kind of uh, facilitate this kind of, kind of you know, social onboarding that we're talking about. Yeah. And uh, before before wrapping it up here, I'd like to ask you, Andrew, sort of your views on uh, what's the role of streamers currently in terms of player acquisition retention? We're looking at the current state of the market and uh, how do you expect that to evolve with cloud gaming? And maybe even more adding to that, uh, do you think there's something that other consumer software companies could learn from working with streamers and this ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, I think I think if you if you zoom out um, in the ecosystem right now, uh, it's it's a very very interesting time for anyone that is building something for consumers, right? Um, you know, we are uh, now um, you know 13 years into the smartphone platform. Um, there are things like uh, you know VR, things like cloud gaming, which are you know still I think um, you know pr pretty early in that cycle. Um, we, you know, un un unlike, you know, the era in which, you know, Supercell and Zynga and those guys were, were created, there hasn't been something, you know, recently, you know, that is, is, is just explosive. I think my observation about video, you know, might, might be the closest. And so I think what you're seeing is across the entire startup ecosystem um, and of, of the many uh, thousands of companies we might evaluate, um, you know, in, in, in a given, uh, you know, period at, at Andrews Horowitz, what we see is that this whole idea of going to market by partnering with influencers and uh, streamers and celebrities is now just like a core part of how every consumer company has to think about, you know, bringing their company to market. And so, um, you know, so, so some of the things that we're seeing in other, um, in other places, and then I'll, I'll come back and, you know, talk directly about games, but uh, for example, if you look at, um, you know, uh, we have an investment in a company called Substack, which is the ability for an individual writer to basically host a newsletter, kind of like, um, you know, Ben Thompson, uh, who writes Stratechery, uh, you know, just writes a newsletter and you can, you can make a living for yourself just writing this newsletter. And that's your, you know, that's this new form of work that you've created. And so that entire business is about providing you know, tools to that. Obviously, Shopify is a great example of one that's been, you know, hugely successful. Patreon as well, you know, partnering with mostly YouTubers and musicians and so on. And then there's a lot of really interesting kind of, you know, um, niche ones like, for example, Fit Plan is one that allows uh, fitness influencers on YouTube to be able to create a product around um, selling, you know, fitness programs 
uh, you know, to, to their users. And so I think this is this recurring pattern that's happening over and over again, which is how do you how do you sort of you know partner with the celebrities in a given platform and have them work with you to to you know to promote that. And so I think um, you know given that this entire infrastructure is being built, I think across all consumer applications. Uh, you know, games is definitely one where we've seen a lot of, you know, deep forward thinking. I mean, you look at the, you know, Laurent launch and everything that they've done around the random key drops on, you know, on Twitch um, and, you know, um, and having this, you know, beta where everybody, you know, all, all these streamers were playing just like an incredible kind of cutting edge job in, um, you know, le leveraging, um, you know, all, all of these streamers. So I, I think, I think this is just going to be a trend that continues. I fully expect that. Um, you know, just as Thor was talking about, you know, if you if you went back in time and, you know, you're playing like Ultima, you know, like someone like Lord British, who is like the celeb at the time, like they don't automatically become a, you know, multimillionaire by being like an in-game celebrity. But like, I think that that's just going to happen. Like, you know, it's, it'll just automatically, you know, happen that if you build a huge following because you're entertaining or whatever, then you're never going to need to work again um, and you can just make your living off of these video platforms and, and, and being in games, which is, you know, really fascinating. And so no wonder, you know, when you survey kids that are growing up on like what they want to do when they grow up, you know, it's like they want to be YouTubers, they want to be influencers, like this is a very desirable, you know, kind of fun, uh, you know, activity. And so anyway, so, so I think, you know, long story short, I think I think it's it's uh, it's transforming the entire consumer um, you know, startup landscape and certainly games are like leading the way. And so, you know, it's been a very interesting trend to watch. Yeah, I mean, it, it's just to tack onto that briefly. Uh, I mean, we, I think we kind of all know that that social proof is one of the most powerful heuristics that we use to make that kind of shortcut to a purchase decision or engagement decision. So th this sort of you know, celebrity trend is something we're going to see more and more. Uh, it's just uh, it's a very you know, human way of kind of making decisions about where you spend your time and put your attention. Mm, exactly. Hey, thanks, guys. I'm, uh, we're a bit over time here already, but um, I'd like to thank you. Thank you both for this for this discussion. 25 minutes really went by fast. Uh, and um, next up, I'd like to to introduce Paulina again, who will then take take the stage together with with Timo from Small Giant Games. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Anton, for, for uh, moving me back back from BCC. Uh, so uh, for those who joined late, I'm uh, Paulina Martikainen, uh, Investment Director at Maki VC, Early Stage VC Fund Investing in Deep Tech and Brand Driven Companies. And uh, we are proud investors in, in Mainframe uh, and humbled to also have Timo Soinin um, uh, packing our fund with whom we're gonna we're gonna chat now. So um, for those who do not know, uh, Timo Soinen is a CEO, CEO and a co-founder of Ch Small Giant Games, uh, a game development company also based in Helsinki, Finland, founded in 2013, and nowadays one of the fastest growing mobile gaming companies in the world. Uh, so they uh, struck gold with the mobile uh, role um, gaming um, role-playing game uh, with match uh, tree battling, empires and puzzles, which uh, essentially is a very approachable mid-core role-playing game. After launching the game in 2017, uh, the company raised uh, $41 million in February 2018. And Empires and Puzzles uh, has reached top 10 positions in over 110 countries over, uh, around the world and was chosen by Google as breakthrough hit of 2018. And the company has been called the most efficient user acquisition machine in the gaming scene by many. In December 2018, Small Giant Game uh, was acquired by Zynga uh, at the valuation of $700 million and continues to operate as an independent studio within Zynga, retaining the unique culture and, and creative freedom. Uh, so Timo, uh, welcome on, on virtual stage. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to, to have, you, have you with us. Um, Let's actually start from the beginning uh, of the journey of small, small giant games. So how did you actually approach uh, launching the new game, Empires and uh, Puzzles, back in 2017 on the market that everyone thought was uh, crowded, uh, where there may be some key takeaways with, with regards to user acquisition from your first games that uh, did not become the hit, the hits that, uh, that everyone wished they would be? Yeah, so thanks, Paulina. A great, great introduction. Now you know all about us. 
need, need to know. Um, yeah, so we started back in 2013, you know, with the promise of, you know, creating something super interesting um, and sort of a groundbreaking on, on the casual front of mobile games, uh, like a million other studios at that time. Um, and um, we did a series of mistakes um, uh, in the process, but, you know, I think that, you know, to cut the very long story short that, you know, I, I think we were focusing on more of a like vanity issues, like, you know, the appearance and the aesthetics of the game, uh, rather than in, in the, the, the retention and monetization ability of the game, um, you know, what kind of systems and, you know, how do you really create that mm. deep engagement, which will eventually lead to monetization as well. Um, and and in, in a way, you could say that, you know, we didn't have much of a marketing capability at all at that time. We were a super small team of 12 people. Um, and we sort of overlooked that idea. Uh, I think that was one of the mistakes that we, the combination of not having enough knowledge on the, on the UA side of things, because at, at, on, on mobile games, you have to actually know UA if you want to become a big one. It's impossible to rely on influencer marketing, uh, you know, a vi virality, social graph. Those days are long, long gone. So you, you, you have to know what you do. Uh, and of course, it depends on genres a little bit. So hyper casual is a different play versus casual games versus mid core mm. RPGs, which we are representing. But basically, you know, the, the mistakes were really leading to the fact that didn't have enough uh, analytical capability and didn't have enough monetization systems in the game. So they were not marketable because it was not profitable enough to sustain the spend. And uh, uh, on the back of that, you know, we we uh, basically started searching uh, for something that would have that like deep retention potential, deep uh, sort of potential monetization potential, um, and and the and the big insight, you know, through research, um, uh, a game that that you know we see an opportunity that um, you know a lot of the casual, basically a billion plus casual gamers were starting to look for deeper experiences, going to the sort of a more hobby like. Uh, games uh, and um, at the same time, the games at that time, games so game of game of wars, uh, summoners wars, and things games like that at that time uh, were really difficult for normal people to play. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the approachability was there. And we said, hang on a minute, can we actually bridge these two worlds by building something right in the middle, having those systems and sort of deep engagements um, in yeah. place, whilst having this like a casual style, super easy in boarding. Uh, um, and, yeah. and 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 that that's really how it happened. And you, you you mentioned the the importance of of investing in in marketing. So what uh, was your marketing team set up actually when approaching the launch, and and how has yeah. it evolved since? And yeah, was so, there maybe some key criteria that you used to actually like hire hire these people? Yeah, that's a really good question. So this time this time around, second time around, we basically we knew we were really good. We we developed the capability of being really good at analytics. So we knew that from a retention and monetization perspective that this game good good scale. Mm -hmm. But the problem was that we were not very good in marketing at all uh, on online marketing, performance marketing. And um, with the help of a couple of consultants with some King background, um, we actually, you know, fine tuned the, uh, sort of the lifetime value models uh, for, for our game, which would allow us to, you know, sustainably start to invest. And then on the back of that, we also managed to hire two of the best people in the industry to join the team. So all of a sudden we had that capability. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then it took us like six to seven months to really verify our data models and optimize create, creative um, uh, creatives for the ads and, and making sure that the data models actually hold water. So that because when, when we start putting our first million out, I was literally sweating because mm -hmm. the money doesn't come back. The yeah. model was saying it's not going to back, but what if? Uh, but luckily, you know, our models were super accurate. And, we, and all of a sudden, the traditional marketing spend turn into a marketing investment. So we exactly. knew exactly, almost exactly, you know, how quickly the money will, will come back if yeah. we invest smartly. So so how did you actually recognize these uh, these two hires to be the, the ones to hire? Yeah, so we we obviously it's about, you know, you know, having having nice and sort of a motivated people, but also, you know, the having a you know those capabilities to to be able to have marketers who uh, can handle creative optimization. Uh, can do, you know, campaign management, you know, work the network. So, mm. you know, marketeers with creative minds, but, you know, super good in numbers, uh, sort of a mathematical approach to the whole whole yeah. uh, process of marketing. Yeah, all right. Uh, I can I can guarantee that there are some people in the audience who, who are here to learn how to how to launch a game or, or how not to launch a game. Uh, so, so can you maybe name 
the single most important learning you made in the very beginning when it comes to it comes to user acquisition work or sort of top of the funnel optimization and, and getting people to actually download the app? Yeah, so I think the, the biggest realization for us was really, you know, cracking and understanding the, the lifetime prediction model and sort of having this mathematical tool that understanding that, that you know, if we acquire a user, how much um, revenue will that user generate over, over the player lifetime in, in, inside the game? And, and just getting that right um, took us a long, uh, took us very long time. Sorry, someone's trying to call me. <laughs> Um, so getting getting that right was critical, uh, and, um, uh, and 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 moving on from that, then then the other big idea was that that you know how to optimize the whole conversion funnel uh, of the UA. So starting from creative. So mm. we currently have in the ballpark of two thousand five hundred different video versions out there in the networks, and it's All a right. continuous approach that we do. And you basically, you know, start from uh, shaving off the conversion percentages from from the from the creatives. Then you go to the app store optimization, where you really sort of need to work on your creatives there, make sure that the conversion is optimized. And then, obviously, when players land into the game, then it's about the tutorial conversion and so forth. But really focusing on this approach. And then uh, the third really important thing, actually, I talked to a couple of game game developers early this morning, is that. Uh, you have to choose your battle. So, uh, and from in terms of uh, uh, creative, how do you say creative? Uh, sorry, advertising channels. Uh, do not throw in like you know, try to optimize your your sort of work in, in five to ten channels. Pick the two big ones, Google and Facebook, to start with, because if you master those, uh, and then you have you you can actually scale almost infinitely. Uh, from a from a spend perspective, but you know it takes a long time to master those and tame those evil algorithms. Uh, yeah. We're still not there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. On a sort of very practical level, since I know there are a lot of founders there, um, how did you actually approach decisions around, for instance, segmentation? So, was there, for instance, you mentioned, uh, of course, customer acquisition cost is probably one that you one that you were looking at, and then on the other hand, lifetime value. So, was there, for instance, a certain ratio in the beginning that you thought was satisfactory enough to then sort of think yeah, yeah, think absolutely. of a specific segment as as worth targeting? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, it's a combination of obviously we have uh, something called ROAS, a return on ad spend, mm-hmm. uh, sort of a payback window. So we. We had a certain uh, payback window as, as an initial target, which was a relatively short period of time. So that, you know, if we can reach that, then we know for sure that we're going to get our money back. And 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 you basically uh, on a cohort level. So there's there's no one magic bullet. So we mm. you do a number of experiments and you go to pretty granular. You do on a cohort level. So this acquired cohort, let's say, using Facebook with certain targeting criteria, with certain certain bid price, with certain uh, um, uh, creative ad. And that creates, you know, and those users coming from that combination is a cohort. And then you sort of monitor that cohort health and how does it, how do they convert and how, what is the lifetime value prediction? Uh, and then you basically, okay, if, if it works, then you basically start increasing. You give it a little bit more, you know, uh, rope and you start investing more into that area. And at the same time, you have a number of uh, these experiments. And, and for that, you need systems. That's why we developed a bespoke internal um, analytic system to handle all of this. Mm. Uh, that was really the, the 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 best decision probably we ever did during our history. Yeah, yeah. So so when small giant games was uh, then sort of growing immensely immensely quickly after uh, uh, sort of uh, after after the launch and and when once you raised a bit little bit more money. How did the the marketing operations and KPIs overall evolve during the hyper growth time? Was there like uh, some some shift in focus, or was it was it uh, the same same from the get go? No, that, that's a good question. So so we were, I, I think that it was a really a team effort. So the game de- game developers and game designers did a fantastic job because we were able to increase both the retention and and the monetization rate of the game all the time. Mm-hmm. Which obviously, like you know, I'm quoting our UA team said, made their job much easier because you know they were able to do more experiments, they a little bit more risky experiments, see if they pay back. Um, and we were really good in also optimizing our creative conversion, our app store conversion, and also the, the game onboarding. Mm-hmm. So this, this all came together, and 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 but this whole data model and a super granular re- level was actually one of the value creation items for uh, when, when the uh, the acquisition happens. A lot of the 
uh, suitors, uh, uh, including Zynga, looked at it, you know, the elaborate data model and our, you know, really sort of an automatized approach to this. Um, and, and people could easily understand that if you can, you know, fuel that fire, there's a system that works. And what if you create a game two, game three on the back of that system, a lot of value could be created. Yeah, yeah. So, so you have been vocal about that point that that you actually had this sort of own analy- analytics stack at Small Giant Games, uh, and then there is the other half that that says that uh, using external tools is is fine. Uh, I guess it's yeah. pretty obvious where you stand, but can you elaborate? Yeah, a so bit? Um, this, is, this is a really really interesting and, and important uh, question because obviously you have to get started, and mm-hmm. uh, so it's it's perfectly okay, and you should use exter- you know uh, third party systems at least in the beginning, so that you get going, you start building your model and optimizing things to a certain point. Mm. You if you really want to become big and sort of a you know sustainable company your sort of data and your sort of analytics tool is the, is the most valuable part of your company. And you don't want to be at the mercy of somebody else's roadmap on, on that system. So that, you know, if you need something very quickly, a, a new analysis, a new algorithm, a new prediction, uh, that you can potentially do it in, in a matter of hours. And it's already there and it starts to service you. So it's, it, it you know, allows you to go really fast and really accurately. And the second thing, you don't want to, you know, you know, we've, we've seen some of the ad networks becoming game developers and sort of, uh, you know, using the data of other games to actually create an edge for themselves. And you, mm-hmm. you want to protect your data uh, as much as you can, because that's another valuable thing that, you know, um, that how, what, what are the game dynamics and you know, a bit of an internal recipes. So those are the really the, the things, the speed, you know, uh, accuracy, uh, and then uh, data protection, um, why, yeah. why you eventually need to have your own systems. Yeah, yeah. This is going a bit, bit uh, back and back and forth in terms of uh, topics. But, but so you told uh, in 2018 that that uh, small giant games marketing spend was over 90 million dollars to drive the game uh, profitably. So, um, and and now you of course have been have been uh, talking a lot of how like that's that's constant iteration and 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 the role that that the internal stack stack played in in that constant iteration but what but was there maybe still a sort of a certain certain point of time when you actually realize that okay like now we've actually set up a, a functioning marketing funnel and now now we can actually like invest invest in growth and and we we can it's guaranteed that it's 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 somehow profitable yeah so just before we launched the game we we were in a situation that we knew that you know the art dow levels of of the game the monetization metric was was at, at the level that we think that you know, if we somehow crack this thing, this could actually grow. But then we did this. We you know built the predictive algorithms, um, LTV algorithms, uh, and a lot of marketing automation systems. Mm. Uh, actually, start and we started scaling growing. We started really gradual, very small investments through the early weeks. You know, seeing what the thing, and then we started gradually investing before the first million went out. Very in a very rapid space, and then. We had to wait because, you know, you, you know, in order to ver- verify the data model, you have to wait mm-hmm. that the real world tells you whether your model was correct. So we had to wait, you know, several, several months to, to verify that, you know, all of these you know, systems are a go. And, and basically it was about six, seven months uh, after the launch. We knew that now, you know, it holds water. Let's go. And then we really started investing and, and then the hyper growth uh, happened. Got it. Got it. All right. So, so let's uh, then actually start chatting about about those best practices of of user acquisition in mobile games and how they might be applicable then in in cloud gaming context. So this is this is something that uh, Thor and Andrew uh, and Anton already discussed. But but coming from a mobile background, um, do you expect some of these best practices from your world uh, to to translate into into cloud games designed to be played on on desktop? Yeah, obviously, I'm I'm not an expert on cloud gaming, but you know, maybe mm-hmm. a comment a couple of uh, points from Thor and, and uh, Andrew that I think you know you know when when the early 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 era of, of cloud gaming happens, you know, I think it's going to be there's going to be you know a couple of big games who will be able to do you know social marketing. They will be able to do influencer marketing, perhaps even celebrities. By the way, I don't believe in celebrity marketing at all. <laughs> But 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 the what 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 will happen eventually that you know this will get you know so competitive and so much volume you know in mobile games we have millions of mobile games out there and once the cloud games you know the same sort of explosion happens you will have to 
uh, have this combination of things. Obviously, you, there is a very important dynamic of having a community approach and you know, you know, social uh, sort of a recommendation, social you know, user acquisition. But my prediction is that you know, this you know, you know, important analytics-driven performance marketing principles will also uh, uh, be more prevalent for cloud games because of the, the competitive intensity out there. And then therefore you will need to have a lot of, lot of these analytical systems. You need to have uh, multi-talented you know, user acquisition teams with creative optimizers, you know, campaign managers, um, you know, uh, network people, and then you need to have data scientists. To build yeah. those models, that because you know it, it's going to get more even more complex when you have more more platforms and more data sources, because you know, you will have to optimize. Let's say that you have a game that people are playing both on PC mm -hmm. and mobile, or maybe even a console. Um, you will have three sets of user acquisition problems because not all platforms are created equal, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden you will you you will find that you know certain people who are you know you are um, you know reaching through PC different set of uh, channels or creatives bit levels will work on that channel versus on mobile versus on on on, on, on console eventually so it's going to get really really um, complicated and I think you know it's um, you know I think the prediction here is that the UA teams will be the kings so they will rule the world eventually <laughs> <laughs> exactly well talking about actually teams uh Obviously, this has been a, a super important topic also at Small Giant Games, as, as mentioned in the beginning. Uh, do you think there will be some key differences between mobile versus cloud when, when uh, considering building, building uh, products or especially growth themes? Yeah, I, th I think the underlying, like I said, the underlying principles are the same. But I think, yeah. you know, obviously the game dynamics, you know, whether you are, you know, from a game design perspective, obviously when you're designing a sort of a MMO, social MMO, or a triple A type of, um, you know, shooting, shooting game, as opposed to, you know, a casual game or a mobile mid core. But mm -hmm. I think there will be interesting sort of use, use cases develop, you know, I'm, I'm coming from a mobile perspective, for example, that, you know, especially on the more mid core games that if you could create completely new use cases for your games, so that, you know, let's say that in our particular case, that if Empires and Puzzles could be played on PC, uh, that we would actually benefit greatly because you know um the, the conversion funnel becomes so much simpler like andrew said mm -hmm. um uh, that all of a sudden you you basically you you optimize your you know your user acquisition uh, messages but then you have much less friction in the funnel you are able to convert user better which typically means that you're you are able to spend more uh because you are sort of uh, the 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 economics of the deal becomes much more simpler mm -hmm. uh, so that that's that that's the big promise for for mobile. So having games that you know can be played on other devices as well, which also allows you to do reach completely new audiences in a different use cases. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Twenty minutes have have uh, flown past super super quickly. Maybe to finish finish this off, a very important question. Uh, so will we see uh, Timo Soinen and from Small Giant Games at any point in uh, jump into into cloud games? <laughs> no, let's see. I, you know, I think you know the we should. <laughs> We're pretty good in mobile games, so you know. For now, you I've know, heard. we're gonna double down on that and let Thor and other smart people. Maybe we can, you know, exchange notes and you know, join forces at some point. But uh, <laughs> now I'm gonna do what we we know. Awesome, good. Hey, hey, thank you, thank you for the chat, and and I will actually next then um, welcome uh, welcome Thor uh, from Mainframe and also Mika from Slush for the for the Q and A session and, and Timo. Timo will uh, stay stay online as well. Timo, I'll call you after this is done. Okay, done. <laughs> All right. Um, I must admit that this will be the shortest Q and A session we have ever had at Slush, but let's do it definitely. Uh, we have time for roughly three, three questions, and I have picked them from from the chat. Um, the, um, Let's find a way uh, to answer the rest of the questions that, that are unable to, to be answered right now, because there is a lot of interesting mm -hmm. questions. Um, actually, starting with you, you Timo, um, a question by Lauri. Um, when creating that deep engagement for empires and bustles, how did you balance between A-B testing and intuition or just general understanding? And especially in the early days when you didn't have maybe that much data uh, to back it up. 
Yeah, that's a good one. You always, you know, I'm not a game designer. We have better people at that. But basically, obviously, there is always an insight, you know, and, and better people have better insights typically. But, you know, we, we had a you know, very rigorous culture from the company because of our previous sort of uh, failures that let's not rely on opinions. Let's test everything. And we actually did have a lot of data. For example, the tutorial of the game, uh, we tested that rigorously. And um, all, let's say a lot of the so-called experts in the industry, the game design experts said that this is complete shit. It's never going to work. And we were silently smiling because we knew that it is working. So, so, so basically, have, have, you know, good people have good hunches and have a couple of tracks and just be brutal about testing. Trust the numbers, uh, put your egos aside a little for, for a while and, and good things will happen. Maybe a follow on that. Um, like, how do, you, how, how do your team basically stay top, on top of like basically the, um, stay up to date regarding the user acquisition trends and what to actually do because you seem to be uh top of your game all the time yeah so we, we are obviously monitoring market rigorously we follow our competitors all the time but you know it's, it's very important to be on top of the market marketing trends you know from a creative perspective and talking with the networks uh you know having data scientists to bring in new things so it's 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 a it's a pretty, you know, uh, fast-paced, ever-changing environment, and you have to have good people, but also not to get too carried away, but be really mindful and focused about what is it, what actually makes a difference, what's worthwhile of spending your time on. Right, cool. Um, Tor, um, there was a question that I slightly molded, um, but considering that mobile first markets could be ready basically for AAA games, mm -hmm. um, soon um will there be basically main platform for the game such as pc or mobile or basically is your team trying to mind keep in mind the the both platforms and and how do you see that yeah it's a great question i mean it's uh coming up with a uh game that translates between the mobile screen and the you know your laptop or your larger screen is uh, both one of the biggest opportunities that cloud gaming affords us but also one of the biggest challenges uh, and I think it's going to take a little while for uh, creative developers to come up with a good uh, prototype and you know, begin to sort of test what is working in terms of uh, whether the game is sort of an equal citizen on both uh, mobile phones and uh, on your PC. From our perspective, we're certainly aiming to make the experience uh, you know, as compelling on mobile as it is on PC, uh, no question. I think. Uh, the ability to allow players to uh, enter their world from their mobile device throughout the day is one of the most compelling uh, kind of features of cloud gaming from our perspective. Uh, whether we acquire people uh, that are mobile first players down the line or whether they come to us from you know more traditional PC audience and then use mobile as sort of an adjacency uh, to their primary experience, that remains to be seen. I think there will be a number of different attempts to try and figure out where uh, actually, your players are coming from first, then how far you go in attempting to kind of make that experience uh, sort of an equal citizen in both screens. It's cool. going to be hard, but it's the, it's the biggest opportunity. Yeah, agreed. Um, then be, maybe a broader question to you also, Tor, um, but Tracy um, kind of covered already in the discussion, but it's interesting. Um, the question goes, if no downloads is an important element of what makes cloud gaming so attractive, why yeah. hasn't cloud gaming been massively adopted? Uh, part of the current audiences yet. Yeah. So I, I think there are a couple of answers to that. Um, you know, number one, many of the uh, kind of user acquisition methods that we were, we've been talking about here today are, are only just now beginning to be available uh, to developers. Uh, there are, you know, so far relatively few commercially launched cloud gaming platforms. Uh, you know, a couple of kind of large contenders in beta still. But uh, I think the second part of the answer. So the question is, this is such an early uh, period in, in cloud gaming that essentially the content that consumers are presented with is content they can get elsewhere, uh, whether it's their PC or their console. Uh, we've not seen the type of cross-platform experiences that we really begin to drive in this kind of virtuous cycle that we're trying to engineer. So that's going to take a little bit of time. I think uh, you know, all the platform holders, whether it's you know, companies like Google and, or others, they, they certainly speak about playing the long game from that perspective. So I think that that certainly is part of it. If if you're accessing your your games, you know, currently by a console or PC by download, you know, 
it, that shift in behavior it needs something, I think, more dramatic and compelling than just the fact that your downward time is, is reduced. That that's you know that's only one kind of technical or basic part of uh, of the proposition. Right. Um, maybe to wrap it up, question for both of you, starting with Timo. Um, obviously, Slush mission is, is, is to help the founders as much as we can. Um, maybe both of you, how, how do you, what kind of advice would you, would you give for, for gaming founders who are in the audience? Um, like, in our general advice, like how, how to understand the market, um, what, to, what to know about co-founders, um, How, how, how would you basically wrap it up for for aspiring founder who are in the audience? Uh, maybe starting with Timo. Yeah, so I think there are a couple of things. First of all, it's, like you said, it's all about people getting those you know co-founders. Like we have co- five co-founders, and we we were in a fortunate position that we were able to both develop the game and design the game, but also do the other parts of a games business. You know, the financing, you know, setting up the the operations and all that stuff. So you have to think about multi-talent. You know, building multi-talented teams, like in the case of Thor. Uh, and his his team. So I think that's super critical. And I often, you know, you just see two guys with a with a great game development, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. You need a lot of other things as well. So focus on that, and you know, and be brutally honest about you know you know what you are good at, what you're not at, what you're not good at, and then you know just basically say, it. okay, even the investors, you can say that hey, hey, look, we're really good at this, but we need a good marketing person or marketing team here. Uh, and we need your money to actually fix that, and that's 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 that resonates well because no one can have everything ready at, the, at any given time. So just think about it, you know, brutal honesty about your competencies. Right. What about Tor? Yeah, I, I would wholeheartedly uh, echo what Timo said. Uh, in the case of Mainframe, we spent uh, quite a bit of time forming our uh, initial team. We actually have 13 co-founders at Mainframe, so that's our lucky number, hopefully. Uh, but it, it is it is just critical if you're setting out to do something. Uh, if you know if you're going to swing for the fences, you know make sure you have your team in place before you enter the field. Uh, so spending that time on getting the team together, making sure the dynamics are good between the team. If you're lucky, you've had past experience in other companies working together, which always helps. Uh, but you know that that team forming moment is the most critical thing that you can do. Uh, it's 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 the one thing that that kind of is a good predictor of future success in my book. All right, I think that's perfect time to wrap it up. Um, first of all, thank you so much, Timo and, and Tor, for for joining, and also thank you, Andrew, uh, for earlier joining. And um, I think this was really nice. Uh, I would like to also thank uh, Makivis and Play Adventures for for helping with the hosting and and arranging this event together with with us. Uh, we have recorded this session, so obviously, um, let's find a way to to uh, distribute this uh, distribute this for larger audiences as well. And And uh, uh, we're going to ask feedback maybe a bit later just to help us improve, improve and, and do more of this later. And, and th- at this point, I would like to say thank you and, and stay tuned for, for different exciting news coming out of Slush and as well as Maki and Play Ventures. Excellent. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.